Fundamentally, friends, every one of us have asked that question. How we answer it will be absolutely essential to how we approach prayer. Because under those questions are an underlying presupposition to how we see the world. Does it really matter if I pray? And will God change the things that I pray about? And if you don't answer that thing correctly, I will guarantee you that you will have a prayer life that is less than desirable. Hopefully during this series, we will discover that prayer really does matter and why it is important for us to pray. We want to study a prayer encounter that Abraham had with God and use the situation as a model for prayer. God has chosen to have an encounter with Abraham and his life was dramatically changed due to the visit with God. And let me just say this to every one of us tonight. That's what happens to us when we have a true encounter with God. It simply will change our lives. Now here's the point to consider about Abraham. Abraham is no different than you and I. And the reason why I want to talk about that is because when you and I talk about biblical characters, you and I just simply think that they're more important than we are. And they're not. God wants to encounter us just like he encountered Abraham. And so we're on an equal playing field as far as God's desire to encounter us. That God will take the initiative with all of us at some point in time to make contact with us. And that contact is called prayer. The only creation that God ever created that was made in his image was man. No other creation has that distinguished trademark. Friends, let me tell you something. You are not like the animals. You are not like the birds. You are not like the trees. You are not like the mountains. You are different. And the reason that you are different is because God created you in his image. And so there is a reason why God created just man in his image. What does it mean to be created in God's image? God is a spirit. Then it must be in our inner man that we are created like him. What did God put in us? that is like him. This equipment that God has given to us, an intellect, memory, imagination. I mean, isn't it wonderful, friends, that you and I have this thing called an intellect that has the ability to make you know, thought after thought and then come to a conclusion. And then this little thing called a memory that has the ability to remember what we thought about. Now I'm beginning to question mine, <laughs> whether it's working right, but the point of it is God has given that to us. He's also given us a conscience that we can't help but make a comparison to what we know to what we do and then we have a self-conscience we know that we're we're existing or that we're alive and then we have emotions and will all that is wrapped into this body suit that equipment that i just described to you is the equipment that god has given to us so that he can make contact with each person this person on the inside of you that is real is the real you when you die, people will say, here is Joe's remains, or here's Jane's remains. Why will they say the word remains? Because everyone knows the real you left, and this is what remains. So what left? The inner man, the spirit. Now here's a fundamental question. Why would God create us with this equipment if he didn't want to make contact with us? I, fundamentally, friends, the reason why you and I are on the planet is because God wants to have relationship with us. And so he created us in his image so that he can make contact with us and so that we could have a relationship with him. I believe this encounter that Abraham had with God can serve as a model for prayer for us. I think most of us can relate with Abraham because when God came to Abraham and began to speak to him, remember this. Abraham had no Bible to relate to to study who this God was. As a matter of fact, he had no one around that had this kind of personal insight to who the Lord was. And so he's got to learn all these things because now a personal example has come to him. And you and I have a great benefit called the Bible and other people that have encountered this. But at Abraham's time, he didn't. Here's the kicker to the message today. God has made contact with you. Try it on this side of the room. God has made contact with you. I believe that God has spoken to everybody, that everybody has heard the voice of God, and I am not talking about 
an audible voice of God, but I am talking about a God that has made contact with you, and I'll say this prophetically, and he will continue to make contact with you. The question is, how will we respond? What will be our response? Obviously, Abraham has a response here. And so when God initiates, now notice this, friends, God initiates the conversation. Conversation is prayer. It is a dialogue. It is not a monologue. God initiates this thing with Abraham. Abraham responds. When the ball is in your court, and listen to this very carefully, when God initiates relationship, he expects the person that he gave a free will to to respond back to him. If we don't respond back to him, intuitively, God knows that we are saying something. I mean, it's a big risk to have a new relationship. And friends, miss a lot of relationships in your life, but don't miss this one. And when God initiates something, and friends, if you're here and you don't know the Lord, I want you to know God has spoken to you. And it's a matter of us recognizing the voice of God. And I want to assume something here, that some of you are here this weekend because God has contacted you. And some of you are here and thinking, I don't even know why I'm here. Well, I do. God spoke to you. And that's why you're here. Genesis chapter 18, verses 9 and 10, and then down to verse 16. Where's Sarah? Now, I've got to set this up for you. Three guys kind of approach Abraham. He does not know that it's the Lord. And that's where we pick up the story. He thinks he's just going to have a nice visit and send them on their way. And lo and behold, it's God. It's kind of a nice visit, isn't it? Where is Sarah, your wife, they ask him. In the tent, Abraham replied. Then one of them said, about this time next year, I will return and your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Now down to verse 16. Then the men got up from their meal and started on towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them part of the way. Should I hide my plan? Now this is the Lord speaking from Abraham. The Lord asked. For Abraham will become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. I have singled him out so that he will direct his sons and their families to keep the way of the Lord and do what is right and just. Then I will do for him all that I have promised. So the Lord told Abraham, I have heard that the people of Sodom and Gomorrah are extremely evil and that everything they do is wicked. I'm going down to see whether or not these reports are true. Then I will know. The two other men went on towards Sodom, but the Lord remained with Abraham for a while. And Abraham approached him and said, Will you destroy both the innocent and the guilty alike? Suppose you find 50 innocent people there within the city. Will you destroy it and not spare it for their sakes? Surely you wouldn't do such a thing, destroying the innocent with the guilty. Why would you be treating the innocent and the guilty exactly the same? Surely... You wouldn't do that. Surely not the judge of the earth would do, or surely uh, the judge of the earth will do what is right. Verse 26, and the Lord replied, if I find 50 innocent people in Sodom, I will spare the entire city for their sake. Then Abraham spoke again. Since I begun, I think there's a ring in this, John. Um, where was I? That takes me off. 27. Then, then Abraham spoke again, since I have begun, let me go on and speak further to my Lord, even though I am but dust and ashes. Suppose there are 45, will you destroy the city for lack of five? And the Lord said, I will not destroy it if I uh, find 45. Then Abraham pressed his request further. Suppose there are only 40. And the Lord replied, I will not destroy it if there are 40. Please don't be angry, my Lord, Abraham uh, pleaded. Let me speak and suppose only 30 are found. And the Lord replied, I will not destroy if there are 30. Then Abraham said, since I have dared to speak to the Lord, let me continue. Suppose there are 20. And the Lord said, then I will not destroy for the sake of 20. And finally Abraham said, this is enough. <laughs> that isn't what he said. Lord, please do not be angry. I will speak. Now notice this, but once more. Suppose only 10 are found there. And the Lord said, then for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. Then the Lord went on his way, and when he had finished his conversation with Abraham, Abraham returned to his tent. Do you have your little outline? Do you want to follow along? Let's take a look at five truths that come through prayer encounters. Five truths that come through prayer encounters. Number one is this. 
Personal transrational information from God is revealed. And I'll explain the transrational here in just a minute. But let's listen to this in verses 9 and 10. Where's your wife, Sarah? They ask him. There in the tent, he said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now listen to this. Abraham is just thinking that these are three Bedouin type of fellows that are going through the desert. And they come up and they start having this conversation. He has absolutely no idea who these people are. And then one of these guys says to Abraham, where is Sarah, your wife? Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody that is a total stranger would ask me a personal question like that, I would ask, where did you get your information? Remember, friends, they did not have Google in those days. (laughs) They could not Google who is Abraham's wife and it would come up before them. Something was going on here. And so he is quite amazed that I'm sure that they're asking about where Sarah or where is Sarah. And he replies in the tent. And then it gets even more personal. He begins to describe to them about their problems about not having children. Where did they get this information? How did that come about? I am sure that when this guy who Abraham does not know at this particular time, says, by this time next year, your wife will have a son. He is overwhelmed. I think this is like a a knee-bending, overwhelming, startling type of conversation that is going on here because somebody is getting information about him that he has never given out before. Now, why am I saying that to you? Because I am saying to you that God initiates prayer and when he does that, he will say something highly personal to you that nobody else knows anything about. Had a conversation this last week with a friend of mine that's been bringing a friend to church. And she came up to me and she said, I got to tell you the story. As a matter of fact, she had gone away and uh, and then came back and said, no, 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 I got to tell you this story. I said, "Okay, what's the story? She said, I've been bringing this friend of mine to church and we've been sitting there and she said, you spoke on this and then told the message. I said, yeah, I remember the message. And she said, uh, during the message, my friend just began to weep and weep and weep and weep. And they came down and introduced themselves and then they went out and she said, we got in the car and he just burst into tears and he couldn't stop crying. Went to, to lunch with some friends and, uh, and he, he said, I'm sorry, but I just can't gain my composure. And they said, well, what's going on? And he, he turned to this friend and said, um, I know you guys set that whole service up just for me. <laughs> like there was a conspiracy that was going on. And, and this gal goes, oh, no, that's God. That's God revealing something in your heart that lets you know that he's really there with you. You see, and friends, if that's happened once, that's, that's happened a hundred times in this place. Where God just transrationally, now see, think about this for a minute. You know, transrational is above and beyond the grasp of science. It's, it's above empirical data. And what happens is that God will start, and it doesn't matter who is used or even if it's through a book or if it's through a movie or whatever, God begins to penetrate and say, I'm initiating a conversation with you. How are you going to respond? And you know it to be so highly personal that nobody else can know about what God has put in his finger on in your life. And that's exactly what's going on here with Abraham. He has initiated something with Abraham and now Abraham is going to respond because he recognizes something transrational above the empirical, something that is noumenal, that is spiritual in contact has now encountered him. And all of us have that encounter. And God is saying, I want to initiate a relationship with you. Understand that, friends. God does that to every one of us. And if if it hasn't happened yet, it will happen to you number two is this meaningful dialogue with god is initiated verse 17 meaningful dialogue with god is initiated verse 17 then the lord said shall i hide from abraham what i'm about to do now let me ask you this question have you ever been to a party in a social setting where everybody there is a stranger to you You don't have to reply, but all of us have been there. And then the most awkward part of the party is, is that when you try to initiate 
some kind of a conversation with somebody else that you don't know. And how shallow that, re, that conversation really is. But how different it is when somebody recognizes you at that party and they come up to you and they initiate a conversation and they're really truly interested in what you have to say and they're really truly interested in what your life is all about. And there is something about that that just allows that conversation to go on to a new level. Well, let me tell you, friends, that's exactly what happens here with Abraham. God initiates a dialogue. He initiates something that he wants to talk to Abraham about. And notice this. And Abraham is really interested in Sodom and Gomorrah. You know why? Because his relatives live there. And so God is saying something to him that I want you. Think about this, friends. The God that said, let there be and there was. The God that created everything comes to man and he says, I want your opinion on this. I want to say something to you. He wants to relate to man. Now, let me ask you this particular question. Do you believe that God has the ability to speak over your head in any kind of information he wants to? I don't think that he, you know, it's a real hard thing, especially for me, for a lot of people to speak over my head. But when it comes to God, he is going to relate to Abraham in such a way that Abraham has an understanding of what God is talking about. And he is, you know, incredibly interested about what God's about ready to do in these cities, these two cities. And so when we look at it from God's standpoint, and we're understanding that he's really talking to, uh, to Abraham, that I have found this to be very, very, very true. And this goes into every relationship that I can possibly think about. That if both parties are not interested in the subject matter, the conversation won't last long. Man, you guys are a tough group. Did you guys get that over here? You know, is that, and, and then, you know, when something comes up in the conversation and you find yourself really interested in it, it's not hard to make conversation. And it's like when God initiates a conversation with people, I want you to know when he hits the peg, when he hits what's going on in your heart, the level of the conversation goes way up because now both parties are extremely interested. And my suggestion to your thinking is this. God knows how to initiate what's really important to you. And that's what's going on here with Abraham. And something begins to take place in a dialogue. You know, I love those kind of conversations where it's a real dialogue. Where you're, not, you're almost interrupting one another because you're interested of what's going on. God wants a dialogue with you. He does not want a monologue. He wants a dialogue. This is going to be a long series if you guys don't get on board. Number three is this. Long-term friendship with God is on track. Long-term friendship with God is on track. Verse 19. For I have chosen him. Now notice the word chosen. So that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. Now the word chosen in Hebrew can be translated to the phrase made my friend. Now, here's just, let's just put this one to rest right here. God chooses everyone. Okay? He chose Abraham. And he said, this is what I want, is I want a long-term relationship with you. I want friendship with you. Here's the truth to consider for just a moment. What does friendship mean? Friendship is a quality of relationship that is higher than just miracle acquaintance. Now, you've heard me say this before, but I'm just going to keep on preaching it because I absolutely believe that this is where most Americans live. Most Americans are deists. They have an acquaintance with God, but they are not intimate with God. And one of the reasons why is that we really don't believe that God wants to be friends with us. We think he's got so big of a, uh, you know, job responsibility that he couldn't possibly be interested in me. And God is just absolutely interested in everything that goes on in your life. And friends, if we do not believe that fundamentally, we will never have a real strong prayer life. God is interested in your opinions. He's interested in mine. 
It's someone you have placed trust in and expect an honest, transparent relationship. Friends whom you allow to be the closest to you will have the greatest impact upon your life. Now think about this. God is saying to Abraham, I want you to come near because I want your relationship to have impact upon me. Think about that, friends. The God of the universe is saying, your opinions matter. Your suggestions matter. Your thinking matters. It really does have an effect upon how I run the universe. And a lot of us just have a hard time believing that. As a matter of fact, let me say this to you. If one person can dominate another person and never take any kind of input or opinions about what they have to say or think, then they're going to destroy the relationship. As a matter of fact, I would say to you, a good description of a relationship is this, mutual respect for one another. And if a person can dominate the other person, then that nullifies the very definition of relationship. And so God is saying, Abraham, I want your opinion. I want you to know what I think. As a matter of fact, friends, let me say this to you. And going back to the first question that I asked, if prayer really does matter, then Abraham has a, he has a continuum upon his life at this particular time that he can direct what God's doing in the world. And God is saying, give me that kind of prayer. Talk to me about that. It really matters. And here's the point of it, friends. Most of us do not believe that God will really listen to us about our opinions, about what we see in the world, that he's really concerned about what's going on in your life. If I, if I can be as bold as to say this, I think that in, in, um, innately, everybody has a blueprint theology that just basically says, and I, I, you know, and I say this all the time and I try to sing the song, but it's not too good, but que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. And the Bible just does not teach that. The Bible says, if you will come to, come, let us reason together. Come, let us talk this whole thing over. And something begins to uh, percolate in all of us when we think, you know, there's really hope that something could change because of my conversation that's going on with God at this particular time. And I just want you to think about this. God is saying, I don't just want to have, quote, a time when you're in crisis, but I want to have friendship with you. And I want you to talk to me. You know, most of the time, you know, people talk in the King James when they're praying, and that's, that's okay. But, you know, sometimes when we pray, you know, and we put in all the these and the thous and all the rest of it, I think God's going, who are you? <laughs> talk to me. Like you talk to anybody else. Just talk. And that's what he wants, friends. He wants somebody that believes that they have influence with God. Number four is this. God reveals his nature to us during prayer. God reveals his nature to us during prayer. Verse 25. Far be it from you, now this is Abraham speaking to God, to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked. Treating the righteous and the wicked alike, far be it from you, will not the judge of the earth do right. Now here's a revelation that is taking place as Abraham begins to know God a little bit better, just in this short time. God is considering judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham is understanding. Now think about this, friend. At some point, Abraham's starting to get the picture. Oh, no. God really means business. He's going to wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah. And the magnitude of the situation now becomes relevant to Abraham. He realizes God means business about this and, the, and his relatives live in these two towns. There's a tension in Abraham's mind. Now, here's where I really want to get down to the brass tacks tonight. Here's a tension that's going on in Abraham's mind. Friends, listen to this. Every one of us have tension with God. Every one of us do. And here's the point. Abraham doesn't know God all that well, but in my Bible it says, shall not the judge of the earth do right, not as a statement, but as a question. Who are you? I mean, are you really going to bring down judgment? Because here's what's really going on in Abraham's mind. The type of God that I thought you were is not the type of God in reality that I see you are. 
And friends, let me tell you something. There is a tension in that. And most of us will come to places in our minds that we will find out in prayer that there are certain things that we have tension in. That God is not the kind of God that we have created in our minds. And let me just say this to you. Every one of us have the distinct potential to create a God like we want rather than the kind of God that there is. And most of us will create a God much like a Santa Claus. Just give me a lot of good things and ho-ho me every so now and then and then I'll be all right, you know. But the point of it is, friends, think about this. Think about it. When reality comes and when tension comes into your life, most of us want to back away from the God that is really being revealed back to a comfort zone so that there is no tension. And I don't know of anybody that grows when they're just comfortable with their theology. And I've said this, and maybe I'm getting way too excited. I don't know. I've said this so many times. You know, God has taken us somewhere. It's not a static thing. Let me just ask you this question. You know, do you believe differently today than you did two years ago? See, and I think every one of us would go, absolutely. What does that tell you about the information you have right now? God's character never changes, friends. But I want you to know the paradigm by which we see God in does change. We see through a glass darkly. And if anybody is stuck in their revelation of who God is, I want you to know you're not going to grow. And here's the point that I want to make. Boy, and believe you me, I'm, I'm living this one. When you get to a place in your life and you just go, God, I don't get it. I just don't get it. I don't understand what's going on. I can honestly say this, friends. When you stay there and you go, I'm going to live in this tension until there's revelation that when you come through that tension, you will understand God better. You may not have all the answers, but you will know that your, your faith is firmly put in somebody that says, I will reveal myself to you. And God wants to reveal himself. You know, the thing that I love about God is this. He's not a God that hides. He's a God that says, come. I want to show you who I am. And one of the ways that he does that is through prayer. Don't back away. You know, one thing that I've learned about God is this. Uh, He really knows how to take the tough questions. He really knows how to take the tough questions. And, 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 you know, friends, even in my mind sometimes, and your mind will go there. Let me, let me just say that this is an absolute truth. Your mind will ask questions that you're ashamed to ask somebody else. You know why? Because we wouldn't be a good Christian if we ask it. And it's like God doesn't see that thought. Well, he does. See, and I find out that when I jump out there a little bit and go, no, I've got to ask this question, that lots of times revelation starts to come in that process. And that's exactly what Abraham is going through here. Shall not the judge of the earth do right? Um, I remember reading David. David has this incredible experience. He's bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And everybody is dancing, and they load the Ark of the Covenant on a cart, which they were never supposed to do. They were supposed to carry it on their shoulders. The Levites were. They put it on a cart, and a guy by the name of Uzzah, U-Z-Z-A, the the cows stumble, and the Ark starts to fall out of the cart. Uzzah puts his hand out and touches the cart, and God kills him. Whack! He's dead! You know what David does? He gets angry with God. He goes, how can, I, how can I serve you when you do something like this? And I mean to tell you, friends, we're talking about somebody that really knows God. And part of the mystery of knowing who God is is this, is that we will never understand him totally or completely for the rest of eternity. But David works through that tension and finds out again who God really is 
But those moments will come in your life. And that's exactly where Abraham is. When you get to those moments in your life and life is not working out like you want it to work out, what are you going to do? Find out who God is? Or go back into your comfort zone and just let Kesara Sarah take over? Seeing God saying, I want you to push in. I want you to come to know me. I want you to know me intimately. Got your attention finally. Number five. Trust your prayers have influence with God. Trust your prayers, that your prayers have influence with God. Verse 32. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry. <laughs> kind of get it where, I mean, Abraham's in this place where he's asking God a lot, you know, and he's just going, whoa, I don't know you all that well, and I hope this doesn't upset you. But one more time, can I ask this question? Husbands and wives, we ought to know about that. Okay. I'm sure that Abraham at this point of the conversation is thinking, how far can I go? Some of the greatest prayers in the scripture come from people who are willing to ask for really big things. We serve a really big God, and sometimes I think we limit God by not making big requests. Moses, and we're going to study this prayer of Moses. God, you know, takes him out of Egypt, and they're out in the desert and Moses is up on the mountain and he's receiving all these revelations from God and then God says Moses get yourself down from this mountain for the people you brought out of Egypt have corrupted themselves you know and so Moses goes down and there's a great party that's going on and God says Moses I'm gonna wipe him out now friends that just think about this for a minute you talk about small man Big God and God listening to small man, this is exactly the prayer that's going on. And, and God says, I'm going to wipe him out, Moses. And Moses stands up and says, wait a second, God. Now think about this. Now can you imagine somebody telling God, think about this. I, read your Bible. That's what it says. I'm not reading from Shakespeare tonight, friends. This is true stuff. And he says to God, if you kill all these people, then what will the Egyptians say? That you just brought us out here to wipe us out? And God says, now I'm paraphrasing this, of course. <laughs> Moses, you got a point. <laughs> and he changes his mind, friends. I mean, the reason that we have Israel on the planet today is because of this particular prayer. See, and the, and the simple fact of the matter is that when we really get down to the basis of what prayer is all about, and I'm struggling in my prayer life, this is more to me than anybody else, is does my prayers really have effect on what's going on in the planet? And I find out that in the scriptures that people that really believed that they had influence with God really did move the hand of God. As a matter of fact, if I can say this to you, I believe this is what happens when we pray, is that God becomes partial impartially. Because now, because he's having to work through all these things about being just and all the rest of it, that when we, his kids, call upon his name and say, God, you've got to do this thing. I'm really, you know, concerned about this particular aspect of my life or what's going on in my mate's life or what's going on in the church's life or what's going on in my community. And I'm expecting you to come and do something about it that that allows God's hand to be freed upon that situation. And God begins to move. Now hear this. Abraham. Praise God down six times. Six times. And he says, uh, just once more. Somebody's phone's ringing. <laughs> just once more. And then I won't bug you anymore. Now listen to this, friends. Abraham put the qualifications on the asking himself, not God. I'll just ask once more. And see, all of us have already gone there. What if he wouldn't have put that qualification on? What if he would have prayed the seventh time? What if he would have prayed the seventh time? See, six is the number of man. Seven is the number of perfection. Uh, worship team, you can come on up. I was raised in a Pentecostal church. And I thank God for my heritage. And uh, 
while I was around that church and around those people, there was always a little phrase that they always used, and it was, pray through. Pray through. Never knew what that meant. But they'd always say, pray through, pray through. And you know what I think pray through means now? That I'm a pastor and all that kind of stuff. I think pray through means that when God has placed something on your heart about something he wants to do, you don't quit until he comes through. You don't quit. Men ought always to pray and not faint. Or give up, as some translations talk about. And there are things that God has put upon your heart that he wants you to pray through. Friends, I don't understand all the dynamics that happen in spiritual warfare. All I know is this. There is one on this planet called the God, small God of this planet. And he resists what God wants to do. When you go back and look at the prayer of Daniel, from the time that Daniel started to pray, when Michael the archangel finally got to him, he said, Daniel, I want you to know, from the day that you started to pray, I was on my way with the answer, but the prince of Persia stopped me and I had to wrestle for 21 days. And as a matter of fact, I had to call in some other help before I got through. Did you get it? Before I got through. And there is something about us that God has relegated to us that says, don't give up. Don't give up. The hope of what God wants to do in the world today, friends, really comes when you and I say, you know, uh, prayer's hard work, but we're really wrestling with something that God says, I want to manifest myself on this planet, and I need people that will grapple with me on the issues of life and not give up. I want you to stand. I uh, hope I can remember this. I told you my memory's going, so pray for it. Uh, three categories of people here tonight. Some here want to start a new prayer life. God's going to initiate that. Others, your prayer life has gone stale. And God wants to start a new time with you. And then there's others that are just saying, I just want my prayer life to improve. And I want you to, uh, I want you to seek the Lord as we sing this song, and then I'm going to come back up and pray with you.